Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all so much for being here with us tonight. My name is Sandra De Castro Buffington, and I'm director of Hollywood Health and Society, a program of the USC Annenberg Norman Lear Center. Our mission is to harness the power of entertainment media to improve the health and well-being of people around the world. It's a very special evening for us to be here in Washington, D.C., bringing Hollywood to Capitol Hill. We're focusing tonight on global health and the way Hollywood TV shows like Law & Order SVU take on these topics and inform their audiences while entertaining them. The screenwriter Robert McKee once said, stories are the creative conversion of life itself into a more powerful, clear, more meaningful experience. They are the currency of human contact, and it is this currency that we are celebrating tonight. I'd like to start by recognizing the co-chair of Hollywood Health and Society's board, Dr. Neil Baer. Thank you, Neil, for all you do for our program and for the world. I'd also like to thank Courtney Singer, my colleague at Hollywood Health and Society, and Jean Brodeur and Jennifer Grodsky of the USC Office of Federal Relations for their contributions to this wonderful evening. Hollywood Health and Society works with television writers to help them get accurate global health content from experts for their scripts. By doing so, we harness the power of storytelling to educate and inspire viewers about the most important global health topics of our time. We recognize that television, film, and new media can educate, entertain, and inspire. And speaking of inspiration, tonight we have an extraordinary panel, including Dr. Neil Baer, executive producer of Law & Order Special Victims Unit, Mariska Hargitay, star of Law & Order Special Victims Unit, and founder of the Joyful Heart Foundation, and Sally Canfield, Senior Program Officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Due to production schedule changes, Christopher Maloney is unable to join us this evening. Now, I'd like to talk about Hollywood Health and Society's role as a bridge between Hollywood's creative community and the world of public health. Many of us in this room have asked, how can we possibly reach people around the world with life-saving global health information. What could possibly capture and hold their attention? As Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. The answer is storytelling, on air, on screen, and online. Hollywood Health and Society works with many of the world's master storytellers. Their shows reach up to 20 million viewers in a single hour in the U.S. alone, and over 400 million viewers in more than 100 nations around the world. Our funding partners recognize the power of entertainment media to improve, the he to improve health and save lives. Hollywood Health and Society has been funded for the last eight years by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and we also have funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the California Endowment, HRSA, ONDCP, NIH, AHRQ, and others, and you in this room know what that alphabet soup means. <laughs> According to the 2005 Health Style Survey, nearly two-thirds of regular viewers of television reported that they learned something new about a disease or how to prevent it from dramas and comedies, and nearly one-third of those viewers took action on what they learned. So Hollywood Health and Society provides a sustained and systematic program of outreach to writers and producers to increase the accuracy of public health content for their scripts. And we measure the impact of those TV health storylines on viewers. So let's take a look at an example. This is an example from ABC's Grey's Anatomy. Both Hollywood Health and Society and the Kaiser Family Foundation consulted on this episode entitled, Peace of My Heart. This clip is about preventing mother-to-child transmission of HIV. Sorry, that took so long. Congratulations, you're pregnant. 
You're sure? It's a big day for pregnant ladies. Pregnant ladies everywhere I turn. That's weird. So I'm only supposed to give you a couple of these, but this is like a month's supply of prenatal vitamin samples. They're free. No, I... We need to schedule an abortion. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I... I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I don't mean to intrude, but... You might want to sit with this for a few days before you make your decision. So, there's no decision to make. I'm HIV positive. I knew it. You disapprove. You're here to push some kind of agenda, right? No. No. Listen, if you want to have an abortion because you want to have an abortion, then that's between you and whatever God you believe in. But if you want to have an abortion because you think that's what medicine is telling you to do, then that's between you and me. I was ineffectual. It was unclear. I've been on my heels a little bit lately, and I was unclear, so just listen, okay? I wasn't telling you there is some chance your baby might not be born sick. I was telling you there is a 98% chance your baby could be born perfectly healthy. A 98% chance. There's a higher chance of your baby being born with Down syndrome than there is of you passing HIV onto your child. I don't... I just... I, I can't... I know you gave up about having children a long time ago, and I understand that it's difficult to readjust your thinking so quickly, but Sarah, if you take your meds responsibly, there's no reason why you can't have a beautiful, healthy baby. This is your chance, if you want it. This is your chance to be a mom. A 98% chance. 98% chance. The impact was powerful. The first time this episode aired, it reached nearly 17.5 million viewers. The Kaiser Family Foundation conducted three random telephone surveys of 1,500 regular viewers, one week before the story aired, one week after, and again six weeks later. The question was asked, as far as you know, if a woman who is HIV positive becomes pregnant and receives the proper treatment, what is the chance that she will give birth to a healthy baby that is a baby who is not infected with HIV? The correct answer was greater than a 90% chance. Before the episode aired, only 15% of viewers got the answer right. The week after the episode aired, 61% of viewers got the correct response. Six weeks later, 45% remembered the information correctly. This means that from baseline to six weeks later, there was a 300% increase in knowledge, and that eight million viewers learned this information for the first time. So we work with most of the major scripted shows in Hollywood, including dramas, comedies, Spanish language telenovelas, children's programming, and more. And we recognize exemplary TV health storylines at our annual Sentinel for Health Awards ceremony at the Writers Guild of America West. And you can see Neil is moderating. Well, I guess you can't see him now. <laughs> well, now I'd like to introduce our panelists for the evening, starting with a Sentinel for Health Award winner, Dr. Neil Baer. Dr. Baer is a Harvard-trained physician, a pediatrician, and former executive producer of the Emmy Award-winning series, ER. He is currently executive producer of Law & Order SVU. Dr. Baer has also somehow found the time to mentor a teenager in Mozambique who is orphaned by HIV AIDS. The boy's name is Alcides Suarez. And Dr. Baer and movie director Chris Sala gave Alcides a video camera and taught him how to shoot. The result is a stunning documentary film called Home is Where You Find It. And we'll show you clips shortly. As co-chair of our board, Dr. Baer makes a tremendous contribution, not only to our program, but to many artistic and philanthropic endeavors around the world. Also joining us tonight is Mariska Hargitay. Now, it would be nice to have some light on our panelists, because I don't think you can see them, and it feels a little strange to be introducing them in the dark. Thank you. Uh, okay. I know, that would work very well. 
Ms. Hargitay is truly a force for social change. She has played Detective Olivia Benson on Law & Order SVU for 11 years. Mariska won the 2006 Emmy for Outstanding Actress in a Drama Series, a 2004 Golden Globe Award, and has earned many more awards and accolades. While for most, those achievements would be enough for a lifetime, Mariska is not content to stop there. Inspired by her role as Detective Benson, Mariska founded the Joyful Heart Foundation in 2004 to heal, educate, and empower survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, and child abuse, and to shed light into the darkness that surrounds these issues. Joyful Heart runs retreat and community programs that use innovative approaches to healing. They also collaborate with government, nonprofits, advocates, and survivors to address these issues strategically. We'll hear more on the important work of the Foundation from Mariska shortly. And next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Sally Canfield, Senior Program Officer for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Ms. Canfield provides strategic counsel to the Foundation leadership regarding their relationships within the advocacy, policy, and political communities. Sally manages a multi-million dollar grants portfolio that includes high visibility partners such as the One Campaign. She has had a distinguished career in the executive branch, on Capitol Hill, and in two presidential campaigns. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. And now, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Neil Baer. Now, Neil, you are a showrunner on a hugely successful TV series, a filmmaker, and a medical doctor. You have applied your integrity, knowledge, and skills to something rare, to addressing global health in film and television. And you take it a step further by showing women and children in developing countries how to tell their own stories. So on that note, Shall we start with a clip from your documentary? Great. Uh, just to set it up, this is a, I think about a four-minute clip. We, um, I have a uh, work with an organization called Venice Arts, and we teach people photography so that they can tell their own stories. And so you'll see some of the photographs that 18 AIDS orphans took. Uh, we bring in photographers from the United States and then also use local photographers as well. And then when we leave, we establish a photographic institute wherever we've been so that the young people, we also did it with mothers with, who are HIV positive in Cape Town, South Africa as well, um, so that they could tell their own stories. Because in the past, documentarians and photojournalists have been outsiders and gone in and taken pictures and told stories and then left. And that leaves still the side of the story uh, of those who are uh, the insiders. So by giving people cameras, and in this case a movie camera that actually Mariska and Chris bought for us, um, we're able to help people tell their own stories as well, which adds more complexity and more layers to the story.
My name is Alcides Soares. I made this film. I am 16 and I am an orphan. My father and my mother died of AIDS. I have a younger sister who lives nearby and I have a little brother. I don't know where he is. My dream is to find my brother. I am lucky to have Vovó. She took me in after everything happened. I cook and I clean and I push her to church every day. And she gave me a place to live. It's a mile and a half to church. Some photographers from America came to Rincontro. They gave us cameras and they taught us how to take photographs of our lives. My friends took all of these pictures. I don't like to tell anyone that I'm just an AIDS orphan. People think that all AIDS orphans are HIV positive. People, you know, they discriminate against you. Not all orphans have someone to live with, to take care of them. But that's what we all want. Some live in shacks. Some live on garbage dumps. Não tem um caminho que eu puder dizer de que vai lá buscar a ele para vir viver conosco, porque nem sei como, está longe, está fora de que nem sabe, você seja de que não sabe onde está, não sabe se está em Zambeza, não sabe se está em Beira. Então as coisas ficou assim. É, é, é assim, a reencontro há de me ajudar. Estão para telefonar para ti Nando, há de me ajudar. Então, para obter uma informação através do teu lado, para ali, para saber onde ele está, se está em Zambés ou está na Bela. Depois, eles já me oferecer um dinheiro para ele levar, o um dinheiro suficiente para duas pessoas já volta. Agradeci, então, se for assim, eu também agradeci. Para estar perto dele. Thank you. So that, the film is actually 27 minutes, and uh, it's been at 25 film festivals, and Alcides was just in London at the Human Rights Watch Film Festival, so it's, it's completely changed his life, which is really gratifying for all of us who, who worked with him. If I t uh, told you, and he, and he did find his brother um, after many months, and that's a quite compelling scene, um, and he was reunited with his brother after 10 years. Um, so if I told you that there are between 14 and 20 AIDS uh, orphans in Africa, or that uh, there are 300,000 children, maybe 320,000 children who are getting ARVs, antiretrovirals, in Africa for the treatment of, of HIV AIDS, or that um, there are um, 430,000 new infections of HIV in children every year, or if I told you there are 21 
uh, 2.1 million people, children, that is, who are infected with HIV. It's hard to fathom those numbers. What does it mean 2.1 million children have HIV? What does it mean that there are 14, 15 million kids? There are four or five Los Angeles filled uh, with AIDS orphans, kids who won't have parents um, telling them good night, children who are, as Alcides said, often, not always, some live with extended families, fortunately, uh, but there are no foster homes per se in Africa or orphan, there are some orphanages, but there's not a, a system like there is in the United States. You don't see that kind of problem in the U.S. If I tell you all those numbers, which are the best numbers we have from UN AIDS, it's hard to fathom those numbers. It's hard to really put in our heads. We don't, we, somehow we're not structured neurologically to understand what that means. I don't really know what it means to, to, that 2.1 million children have HIV or AIDS. Um, but I do know what it means to see a story, and you just saw a short version, of one child's search for family after his parents have died of AIDS. And I can relate to that because I have my own son, uh, or you have children, or you have nieces or nephews or cousins. You can bring your own life's template to the story you just saw. And you were moved when I told you that he found his brother. And you're moved by stories because I think neurologically we're, our brains are structured to tell stories. That's how we keep track of our lives. If, if we lose the ability to tell stories, as we do with, if we have Alzheimer's, say, then we're in a complete state of flux. So storytelling for me is the power for change. And, and while statistics are important so we know what we're working with, we feel in Los Angeles where we, where we write the show and in New York where we make it, that the storytelling part is what can change the world. Because if you're moved by the stories that we tell, then we, we know that you often tell from research we've done, you tell others about it, or you go on the internet to learn more, or you Twitter, or you follow my Twitter, or you look at my bubble tweets, or you go to the links that I send you to to find out about rape in Congo. And if we keep telling these stories that move us emotionally, then there's a chance that we'll influence Congress to deal with this problem of orphans. Um, and providing ARVs. You know, as an aside, ARVs really weren't available, antiretrovirals, in Africa until 2004. So, and only, I told you, about 300 some odd thousand children are getting them, so that leaves about 1.8 million who aren't. So that is a crisis. And so by telling stories, together we can then, I think, foment change because we can tell our Congress people and senators and we can talk about it and we can get involved in many ways. And the last thing I'll say is that with new media particularly, we're, we've been very fortunate at NBC that we can connect our viewers in all kinds of ways to take action because you're inspired. Once you see something, we want to get you before you lose that inspiration. And so if we can get you now to the internet, then we can give you all kinds of ways to take action from reading different books to getting in to writing senators and congresspeople who are particularly interested, to even going there. So um, for me, that's the power of storytelling. It's, it's really the, 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 the power of change. And for me, it's the greatest gift I have because, and that I'm able, that I, I, that I have and I'm able to share. So I feel so fortunate. Thank you, Neil. Sure. I'm just going to ask each panelist one follow-up question at this point, and then we'll have a Q&A &A at the end. So Neil, why, what is it that inspires you to tell stories about global health or, or the little-known stories of people from developing countries? Well, I think there's a, a false view in Hollywood, particularly amongst TV executives, that Americans aren't interested and anybody but Americans. And so many people have pitched shows about Doctors Without Borders and you haven't seen it on TV because they haven't bought those shows. So fortunately on ER and on SVU, we can tell those stories. Why? Because we're a global society. We all, we're all connected through the internet, mobile phones. Uh, one out of three people in Congo has a mobile phone. So 
with that connection, there's power to talk to people and to share our stories. And I do think Americans, I mean, when I hear anecdotally about our show last week or many shows we've done, they don't know that six million people have been killed in Congo. They don't know what's going on, but they want to know. And so for me, that's the driving, maybe because I'm a physician, a pediatrician too, so I like kids and, and I care about kids' health, but I think I'm no different from almost anyone else. I don't think that, you know, we're all interested in those, in those issues. And so I think it's incumbent on us as, as storytellers to share those stories. And it's pretty simple. Um, and just because our show takes place in New York, we have found, and Mariska will tell you some, about some of the stories we've done, we have found ways to tell stories about, about the world because the world is coming here as well. So, so we can't let the sort of parochial, past parochial views stop us from, from telling uh, global stories. And you know what else I want to say is that there's someone here tonight, John Prendergast is here, and, and what really helped, and he's sitting in the back, and what really helps is partnering too because we've learned, we partnered twice with John, once on, on a show we did about um, child soldiers from Uganda and the psychological issues obviously involved in what happens to them when the war has ended, and then recently last week on, on rape in Congo. So we look to uh, beyond ourselves, because I don't know, I don't know that material, but I want it, as Sandra said, and we look to Hollywood Health and Society for medical information to make it, and I don't know the medical answers to many things, or are there people here from, f who've helped us from NIDA in the past, and we've done shows on, uh, uh, and ONDCP, on alcoholism and cigarette addictions and drug abuse. So we do t turn to experts not with agendas, but who have the data so that we can make our shows as accurate as possible because, as Sandra said, so many people, 57 million people watch SVU a week. That's including the syndication USA and, 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 and repeats. But each week, 57 million people watch our show, which we're grateful for, and we want it to be accurate. And so with, that's why we turn to, to people particularly in D.C. And, and, and at major universities, for help in making sure that the stories we tell are accurate. Let's show another clip. Would you like to see retro? Sure. Okay, let's do that. Yes, handles abandoned kids. What's happened to her is a crime. Kids only get this sick when they're not treated. You're treated for what? HIV. She has AIDS. Yeah. Advanced. And her parents didn't do a damn thing about it. Want to see some Hocus Pocus? Check out Dr. Demento's website. The truth about HIV. There's no proof that HIV causes AIDS. The anti-HIV medications Big Pharma makes will kill you. This guy is a fruitcake. According to Hutton, AIDS is a global conspiracy funded by pharmaceutical companies to make big bucks. And commit genocide. My parents believe the government created HIV in a lab, and the CIA spread it in the prisons to kill blacks and gays. How does a doctor believe this crap? He's an AIDS denier, part of a misguided minority who believes that HIV doesn't cause AIDS and that AIDS itself doesn't exist. Two-thirds of the world's HIV-positive kids get infected during pregnancy or at birth from the mother. The rest acquire it during breastfeeding. Okay, so Susan could have passed the virus to Lisa either way. It's a shame. HIV-positive women in this country have a 98% chance of having a healthy baby if they take antiretrovirals during pregnancy and put the child on meds after birth. Which Susan probably didn't do because she thinks HIV is harmless. She put Lisa's life in danger by breastfeeding her and by withholding medication when Lisa got sick. And since any reasonable person knows HIV causes AIDS, that's criminally negligent homicide. HIV attacks the life-saving T cells that fight disease. The virus genetically mutates the host cell, turning it into an HIV factory, which makes more copies of the virus. Eventually, HIV kills T cells faster than the body can replenish them, destroying the immune system and causing AIDS. Dr. Warner, can you tell the jury how we know this? HIV has been isolated, photographed, cultured, and grown outside the human body. Its genetic structure is fully documented and it's killed more than 25 million people since 1981, including Lisa Ross.
That clip, did that show did not go over well. I, I gave a presentation in Paris about two years ago uh, with the Aspen Institute. It did not go over well with the Gambian and um, South African contingent, but that was the point. And then there are many people in the United States who don't believe that HIV causes AIDS as well. And it got people stirred up, and then when that happens, I'm really happy because, yeah. because then they will go and have a conversation and talk about it and hopefully you know, do some more research. Well, um, this is a really important clip, and Hollywood Health and Society conducted an evaluation of the impact on viewers. And our research showed significant knowledge gains among viewers who had never been tested for HIV, an increased awareness of HIV deniers among females, and an increase in global health priorities among viewers. So we use these findings to show that powerful storytelling like Retro, this was a clip called Retro, can impact viewers' knowledge and attitudes about global health. So let's transition, and now it's time to hear from the extraordinary Mariska Hargitay. And she'll start by showing us two clips of her compelling work on SVU. And she will also talk about how her role on this series inspired her pioneering efforts to address the devastating reality of sexual violence and abuse and to help survivors to heal. So Mariska, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you, Sandra. And uh, thank you, everyone. I, I'm, I'm so honored to be here. And the people tonight have come up to me and said, thank you for your work. And I just want to reflect that back to you and say thank you for your work. Um, when I started on Law and Order Special Victims Unit 11 years ago, sexual violence had never played any significant role in my life, and certainly not on a daily basis, and uh, certainly not the kinds of issues that the show addresses. And then there I was, immersed every day in some of the worst that people can do to each other. But it wasn't just the scripts and uh, that pressed the tragedy and the per pervasiveness of these acts into my consciousness, it was actually the letters that I was getting. Um, I'd appeared in you know, lots of other projects uh, before SVU, and I had gotten letters like, hi, my name is Amy, I'm 16 years old, and I love your show, can you send me a photo? Um, now I was getting, hi, my name is Amy, I'm 16 years old, and my father has been raping me since I was 12, and I've never told anyone. So I, uh, I remember the breath sort of leaving my body as the first uh, letter came. And I've gotten thousands of letters like that since. So, you know, the show operates in the world of fiction. And I'm fortunate that I can close my dressing room door and go home at the end of the day to comfort and safety. But the show's fiction are based in facts. And the facts are simply horrific. Nearly one billion women, that's one in three women worldwide, will be beaten, raped, and abused during her lifetime. Yet, around the world, women suffer in silence, ashamed, and alone. So every two minutes, someone in the United States is sexually assaulted. Rape and sexual assault have the lowest reporting, arrest, and prosecution rates of all violent crimes in the United States. Neil, who you've heard from, our brilliant Neil, <laughs> And our brilliant team of writers have taken some of the darkest crime and the worst human suffering imaginable and brought them out of the shadows and placed them into the sharp light of primetime television and allowed us as actors to be the voice for victims. Please watch this portrayal of, an ex of the experience of a courageous survivor in the aftermath of her assault. How did he get you? After I ran out of the apartment, I cried for like three blocks. Then I noticed a man was walking next to me. He said I was too pretty to be crying. Got to his van, he said he had something that would make me feel better. He went into the van? No. He put a handkerchief over my mouth with some kind of chemical on it. That's all I remember before I woke up. Where was that? On a concrete floor. It was pitch black. I didn't have any clothes on. We 
I stood up and felt along the walls, screaming for help. I got to a metal door and I started pounding on it. There was a mattress. I laid down on it and cried. I must have fallen asleep. I woke up when he came in. He put a combination lock on the inside of the door. He got on top of me. I kicked and screamed and hit. He said he'd come back when I was ready to be sweet. He said if I couldn't be nice, he'd let me starve to death. I thought I made it about a week without eating. He said it was only two days. Every year, more than 200,000 courageous individuals report their rape to the police in the United States. Almost all are asked to have a rape kit collected. The process that you just saw in the clip can take four to six hours. We've learned that the healing process for survivors begins and is often sustained in the response of the communities around them. The medical community is often the first responder in the rape crimes and getting that response right is critical for the survivors and our society. So that is why I'm so proud to be working in partnership with the government and sexual assault advocates to educate medical professionals to ensure that they are ready and prepared and trained before the victim comes to the door and not reading out loud the rape kit instructions uh, the first time, for the first time as the victim is sitting on the table, which is an unfortunate reality that we are still hearing about today when survivors reach out to us. So our hope is that in educating the medical profession about sensitive and effective rape kit collection will lessen the trauma that the victim suffers, bring perpetrators of sexual violence to justice, and that journey toward healing can begin. The potential benefits of testing of the DNA evidence in the rape kits are enormous. It can identify an unknown perpetrator, it can confirm the presence to a known assailant, corroborate the victim's account of rape, and exonerate innocent suspects. National studies have shown that cases in which rape kit was collected, tested, and found to contain DNA evidence are more likely to move forward in the criminal justice system. For example, when New York City began to test every book, rape, sorry, every rape kit, um, the arrest kit, the arrest, um, arrest rate for rape kits skyrocketed from 40% to 70% for reported cases. And conversely, untested rape kits typically represent a loss of justice for rape victims. And in the United States today, it is estimated that there are hundreds of thousands of untested rape kits sitting in police evidence storage facilities and crime labs across the country. So we're working in collaboration with the Department of Justice, Congress, law enforcement, advocates, and survivors to bring attention, funding, and new legislation to eliminate the backlog. So, so many of the fierce men and women who are fighting for justice of rape victims are in this room tonight, and for that I am so grateful. Um, in April of last year, uh, Nicholas Kristof wrote an editorial in the New York Times entitled, Is Rape Serious? Now, about the backlog of untested rape kits in police freezers around the country, he concluded the quote from Polly Poskin, an executive director at the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault, Quote, if you've got stacks of evidence, physical evidence of a crime, and you're not doing everything you can with the evidence, then you must be making a decision that this isn't a very serious crime, end quote. So you have my fierce commitment and ongoing support of Joyful Heart to continue to stand with all of you and do whatever it takes to bring justice and healing to survivors. Sexual violence is not only an epidemic in this country, as we all know. It knows no borders and touches every corner of the globe. When I was preparing to shoot the appropriately titled episode, Hell, that Neil just told you about, in fall of 2009, I read and watched films about the atrocity of being perpetrated in Congo, Uganda, and Sudan. I learned of gang rapes, internal mutilations, amputations, and rape as an instrument of war. I learned of women who had been raped so violently that they can no longer control their bowels. I learned of government, military, and social systems 
that not only fail to prosecute those committing these acts, but fail to condemn them, and worse still, harbor, protect, and sometimes include the perpetrators. I learned of hundreds of thousands of women imprisoned in silence of fear and shame. Let's take a look at a clip from a recent episode, one that I'm so proud of that just aired last week called Witness. <laughs> 